So as, as uh, David was saying, so I'm going to be talking about the winner's curse. Um, and, and I think that it's been outlined enough kind of uh, what this is. So like imagine that you're some um, sad grad student and you've been trying a bunch of different projects and none of them are, are panning out and then you finally um, find some project and you get some significant effect in your project, right? So what might be, you know, our first concern about, oh, and so then we, then we replicate our project and in our replication, we see that our effect size is much smaller than what we saw in the original study. Okay, so what are, what are, what are reasons why we might not see as strong an effect in our replication? There's two big ones that we might think. Well, I'll give you a hint. One of them's winner's curse. What's the other one that you should think about? with our poor grad student. Sampling yeah, sorry? Sampling uh, maybe sampling variation. Of how are you having the replication study? Yeah, yeah. Also, you know, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, that's, that's, that's true too. If you don't have enough power in the replication. I mean, what I'm aiming for, why aren't you reading my mind, is uh, what Dan was talking about a ton. You know, if, if we're running a lot of studies and then we find one that's significant, then we've, we've run a lot of tests. So I just wanted to remind you about that. But another, another problem might be winner's curse. So I'm going to focus on, on this. And so this is, this is an empirical um, thing that shows up all the time. People would run these big studies, they'd, they'd measure these effects, and then when they would replicate them, the effect sizes they estimated were always smaller, or they tended to be much smaller than what they estimated in the original, in the original sample. And so this was confusing. Um, the, the reason that this is, is related to regression to the mean and the underlying principle is that when we're doing estimation, like, or when we're doing like a GWAS for example, or, or any other sort of empirical study, we're, we're often trying to do two things simultaneously. We want to identify which things are associated with the outcome we're interested in, and so that's selection. Um, but then we also want to estimate, and, and it turns out that you're, you shouldn't use in principle, you can't use the same sample to do selection and, and estimation. And we'll outline exactly why, why that is. In GWAS, this is a really big problem because we have two, two forms of selection. We select by threshold, and then we're also going to select by rank. Um, so first, selection by threshold. So we've talked to Dan. Dan's told us that you know, we need to have a really strict p-value threshold. And so um, we, because at a fixed sample size, with a fixed uh, p-value threshold, we're actually not able to detect things within a certain range of zero, right? Because if, for a fixed sample size, our standard errors are going to be a certain width, and we're only significant if we're, you know, if we're just doing one test, then if we're within, we have to be further than two standard deviations from zero. And so if we're trying to estimate something close to zero, um, then, then we're just not able to do it. And so here's, here's a picture of why this is a big problem. So, so this, uh, this figure here, this is the distribution of, of what we might get if we're estimating some beta. And so the true beta is, is signified by this line here. And when we, um, so estimated by this line here, and then this distribution here is due to sampling variance. And so our sampling variance will in general be about normally distributed. So if the true effect's here, we might see, we might estimate some effect anywhere around here, but centered at the, at the true effect. So that's great. OLS is unbiased. We, we can think that we're going to get the truth on average. However, when we're doing a GWAS or doing anything, we really only focus when we see significant hits. And so if we condition on observing an estimate that is some fixed distance away from zero, then what the distribution we actually have is this thing. We're removing this whole mass local to zero. And so the actual distribution is this truncated normal. It goes up like really high over here. And so what's the mean of this distribution going to be? going to be much higher than our beta, right? Because we have so much mass way over here. And so, so this, is, this is what the winner's curse is when we threshold by, uh, when, we, when we select by some threshold. Um, we have another problem. So, so you know, we, Dan, Dan talked on this. When we're doing GWAS, we are estimating for a bunch of different SNPs. Um, and we'd see a Manhattan plot and we see a big peak in our Manhattan plot. And we're really smart, and so we're like, well, we know that each of these hits that we're getting in our GWAS, some of them represent the same signal because everything is so highly correlated, right? And so, so we're saying, well, we just maybe want to take one SNP from this, this, this region that's highly correlated. That makes a lot of sense, right? So which SNP do you think we would want to take 
in this, in this region of, uh, of highly correlated SNPs. Which one? Well, yeah, which, which, which one do you think sounds reasonable? The what? Yeah, we want to pick the highest peak, right? That, that makes sense. And that's what we do in practice. So, so when we are, are trying to pick which SNP is, uh, you know, is, is you know, our, our hit, when we report, we have 74 hits and, and here's a list of them. What we're doing is we're reporting the SNP that has the smallest p-value. And so it's the one that's most significant. We like that, right? We like that. So let's, let's think about this example. So I want to find out what the uh, expected um, value is of a, of a dice roll. So I rolled these five dice, and, and I want to say, what's, you know, what, what do I expect to be sort of the value that I get when I roll this dice? Wh what would I do in this case? I'm not going to pick the biggest one, right? Because in this case, I would say, you know, from, from these, um, you know, from these, these are all sort of estimates of the expected value of the roll of a dice. Um, and it feels a little silly to say, well, I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna pick the biggest one here, right? And so, so there's, there is some, some uh, winner's curse here as well, because we're saying um, I'm going to select you know, the most significant SNP, and that may not actually be the, the right SNP. That SNP may not represent the expected value, even, even beyond this sort of thresholding problem that I told you. And so if you threshold, you're going to get biased, and then we're doing selection by rank. We pick the most significant SNP, and that's going to inflate our statistics as well. Um, let's think for a moment, though, why, why might it be reasonable to pick the most significant SNP? So I told you why it's, it's silly. Because we're most powered to find it. Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're highly powered to find it. So we don't actually think that each SNP is, is estimating the same thing, right? So we, we think that, you know, if, if we have a pair of SNPs, so if the true effect is some large one, and then we have some SNP here that has no effect, but it's correlated with this one, right? Then in expectation, this, this SNP is going to be, um, you know, in expectation, this one will be the most significant. And so, you know, again, it's not, it's not totally crazy if we want to try to get the best, what's, if, if I have a, a group of SNPs and I know that one of them is the one that has the strongest signal and they don't necessarily all have the same signal, then, you know, maybe we want to pick the biggest one. But, um, but there still is this, you know, we still have, there will be some upward bias due to this rank thing. It's just not quite as bad as I was playing it up to be. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what we should do. So we, we know that we have some GWAS estimates. We've, we've picked out our SNPs and we think they're too big because of the winner's curse. Well, what can we do? Well, there's, there's um, two, two ways that we can deal with this. So the first one is just replication. So again, OLS is unbiased um, in general if we're just doing one test and we're not doing any sort of thresholding or, or rank selection. And so once we've selected the SNPs that we think are significant and we want to know, well, what's, what is an unbiased estimator of the effect of these SNPs, we can just replicate it in, in an independent sample. And so that estimate then will be unbiased because we've not done any funny selection. You happy with that? Um, what we also could do, let's say we don't have a replication sample. Um, and so we're like, I don't, I don't want to you know, use up some of my precious data you know, we, we know from uh, all of our other lectures that we're estimating really small effects. We need to have enormous power to find, or we, you know, we, we want to have as large sample size as possible to identify these small effects. And so um, we don't want to, we don't want to use, up, use up our data. And so maybe we should try to correct. You know, if we, if we can maybe say, well, I know I'm biased. How biased am I? And can I just subtract that bias out? And so there are three, three ways that I'm going to talk about that, you know, one might do this. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of all of them. So I'm, I'm not going to work through the math, um, but if you wanted to, you could find out, well, what do we expect beta, what's the expected value of beta hat for a specific beta and given that beta hat is significant? Because that's the source of the bias. So, oh, and this again, I'm actually only talking about bias by thresholding here. I'm going to just ignore the bias due to, to rank. I don't know anyone who does that. It's a lot harder to, to deal with, just in general. It's not as, not as pretty. Um, and so I'm just going to be talking about reducing bias due to thresholding here. But um, so if we're just worried about um, 
so the thresholding bias, so we're just conditioning on the SNP being significant, then we're going to get, it's going to be equal to beta plus some term here. And it's going to be a function of the probability of how significant that thing is. And so if, if beta is uh, very large, so if the probability that beta is going to be significant for a particular beta, then this probability is going to be very large. So this numerator term will go to zero, and so we won't have very much bias. But if beta is small and there's a very small probability that it's significant, then this term could become very large, because down here this, um, you know, this thing's going to a very small number. And so um, Winner's Curse is going to be uh, worse when we have small betas that are unlikely to be significant. So if we're underpowered, for example. And that goes back, ooh, that goes back again to, to Dan's comment about um, uh, S error magnitude, ex, what was it, ex, exaggeration error. Yeah. That's what it is. And so, so we'll see the, the exagger, er, exaggeration error being very large. Um, well, so we have this function here. We know what the expected value of beta hat is given beta. So what if we just invert this function? We could solve for you know, beta as a function of, of beta hat. And we could just invert it, and maybe that would be a good trick. The problem is that we don't, you know, it would, not, it would be beta as a function of the expected value of beta hat. And all we actually have is, is the beta hat. And so there's some bias due to Jensen's inequality, which is just that if, if there's any curvature in G, and so this function's not linear, and so there is curvature, that in general, the inverse of the expected value of beta hat is not going to be equal to the expected value of the inverse of beta hat. And so, so we know already that this is, this is also going to be biased. It might be a little better than the winner's curse bias, but this will also be biased. So then we could say, well, okay, well, maybe we have a closed form. We know what the expected value of, of or we, we know what the distribution of beta hat is given beta. And so we could, because we have a distribution function, it's closed form, we could estimate through maximum likelihood, right? Um, this, is a, this is a little funny, though. So if we were to estimate uh, beta using beta hat, how many data points do we have to estimate the parameter beta? One. We have one. Why is it just one? Don't we have a million GWAS estimates? You have one beta hat corresponding to the SNP. And so, so we're doing MLE with one data point. So that's a little funny. But we could do it. It's, a, it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that exists. Um, and it turns out that when you do that, um, the MLE solution is, is exactly equivalent to inverting the bias function. Um, and so we know that inverting the bias function is a biased estimator. And so MLE will be a biased estimator in this case as well, the, the same way. Um, so then um, let's think about maybe using Bayesian methods to do this. And so Dan put Bayes' rule um, up on the board earlier. This is, this is what Bayes' rule is in this case. So if I want to know what's the distribution of the parameter beta given, that, uh, given the beta hat and given that beta hat is significant, um, it's then it's equal to the distribution of beta hat given beta. So this is what we know. This is, this is just the variance due to estimation error times the probability of, given the distribution of beta, given that beta is significant. And so this is our prior. And then we just integrate over all of the betas, the whole, the whole beta space. And so we could, we could evaluate um, this if we want. Um, the question is, what do we use as the prior as well? So that's, that's the open parameter. We know what this is just due to the um, properties of OLS. And so all we have to pick is, what do we think the distribution of betas are? And so that's kind of, um, uh, yeah, something we have to decide. I guess you could, you could be informed empirically, but you know, what you might want to start with, what, what's often done, given that this, is, this thing here is normally distributed, then the math is really simple if we assume that the prior is normally distributed. And so you could do that. It'd be really easy and fast. But if we're claiming that the betas are drawn from a normal distribution, um, what does that mean? What's the probability? that a SNP is null for a particular phenotype? It's zero. Do people see why that is? So if we integrated a normal distribution from zero to zero, there's, there's no mass exactly at zero. And so when you assume a Gaussian prior, you're assuming that every SNP has some effect. Um, and maybe we don't like that. 
Um, maybe, we, maybe we think that you know, only 20% of SNPs have some effect. And so that's why some people then will use the spike and slab. And so what a spike and slab is, is it assumes that there's some probability that the SNP is null. And then if the SNP is not null, then, then it's drawn from a, a, like a Gaussian distribution is, is usually what's done. But I suppose it could be anything. Dan? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, let's um, well, let's talk about. It. So I've already talked about how it's it's maybe just easier to do the Gaussian, right? Because it's a uh, um, if if it were Gaussian, then then this whole thing has closed form solutions, so that's nice. Um, why why would we why would we prefer the spike and slab, and why would we why would we be okay with the Gaussian? In what circumstances? Yeah. So, so spike and slab is there's, ma there's a probability that it has an effect of zero, and otherwise it's normally distributed. So if, it's, if the SNP is not null, then it's normally distributed. So as opposed to the Gaussian case, we assumed that no SNPs were null, and that all of them were drawn from a Gaussian. With a spike and slab, we're assuming that some fraction of SNPs are, are null. So why, 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 might we, why, 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 why might we choose that? In which, in which circumstances what, might we be okay with Gaussian? When might we think spike and slab is a lot better? Well, we could think that if we work with a coin just trace, then the body SNPs are not, not much to do with it. They both, so we would think that they would have zero effect. And therefore, we use spike and slab. Yeah, yeah. So, so it really depends on the phenotype that we're looking at. Right, um, I I don't know that. Um, so a lot of things tend to be really interrelated. So so like let's say, um, let's say we're doing educational attainment, right? So what things might affect educational attainment? I mean, lots of things might affect educational attainment, right? Uh, I mean, it's so so. If if I was doing a GWAS of educational attainment, I would say that there probably are. I mean, there, there, there are probably SNPs that are totally null, um, but, but I would think that a lot more SNPs are causal, at least a little bit, um, than, than it would if it were maybe some medical outcome, which has a precise um, uh, mechanism by which it shows up. So like if we were doing eye color, if we're doing a GWAS on eye color, then spike, you know, if you tried to do Gaussian on that, I think it would be just a really bad choice because I, I don't think there's any chance that most SNPs are, are um, affecting your eye color. But you maybe can get away with it for, for behavioral traits, which we think that there's a lot of different things. Could you summarize that in terms of just depends on the complexity of the phenotype that you're looking at? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I mean, I, what's, so the Gaussian case actually is a special case of the spike and slab, right? So, so we say that there's some probability that the SNP is null. And if that probability is 0, then we're in the Gaussian case. Um, and so, so yeah, so, so I guess what we're having to pick then, if we're, if we're only, I mean, you could choose like crazy complex things if you wanted. Um, but if we're picking between these two, it's just a question of, you know, how, how, what fraction of SNPs do you think are, are causal? Making this a little more tricky, though, right, is that because of high LD, I'm not actually asking how, what fraction of SNPs have some effect, but I'm asking what fraction of SNPs have some effect or are in LD with a SNP that has some effect. And so that, that makes you maybe even slightly more comfortable that the Gaussian case might be fine. Um, in practice, though, we find that spike and slab works, uh, works really well. It's a, it's a good approximation. Um, I'll show some results about that. Mm -hmm. what, I was going to ask what level Mm -hmm. So what works, what have you found, so educational attainment, right, what works better than the zero? So, so what, I'll, what I will usually do is, is I will let the data inform what probability to use. So, so I'll, uh, I'll um, plug all of the GWAS summary statistics into a maximum likelihood estimator and saying, you know, if, 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 it's, if the data, if, if the betas are spike and slab, 
then, um, then the distribution of the estimates will be spike and slab plus Gaussian noise. And so I have a closed form distribution. I can use maximum likelihood to estimate the, the, the parameter of what fraction of SNPs are null. And so you're just em empirically informed. Um, so here's, here's just a general, this is a really technical point um, that is, is important to also think about. So there's this paper here, and, and the, the main result of this paper is that there is no winner's curse correction that for every beta is unbiased. And so um, you can get, um, so if you, if, I've, I've shown you like this Bayesian one, and this Bayesian one for, for certain betas might underestimate and for other betas it might overestimate. Um, what's nice about at least the, the um, this Bayesian approach is that it's going to be correct on average. And so, you know, the, this, this uh, expression here, the expected value of beta given beta hat, is, is what we're estimating in the Bayesian case. And the expe expected value of the expected value of the expected value of beta given beta hat is the expected value of beta. And so, you know, with this, we're going to be right on average, but it makes it so that we should be careful if we're interpreting individual SNPs. So, so if I just said, oh yeah, I winner curse corrected this specific SNP and now it's unbiased. And, and I would say, well, no, it's not. I mean, it's, it, yeah, it might be better, but I don't know that this, the effect that you're estimating for that SNP is in a region that is actually unbiased. But if you gave me a big list of SNPs and you said, I winner's curse corrected all of these SNPs from my project, and they're unbiased. I say, oh yeah, on average, probably all of you know. All of, oh, sorry, I'm, I told you I get really excited. <laughs> um, then on average, our, you know, these estimates might be fine. And so that's why I, I like mostly using them in, in aggregate. So I'm going to show you some individual SNP level results. So this will highlight sort of empirically. So this is from the um, education, not the most recent education paper. This is the first education paper. Um, that we had out because we had a replication sample. And so um, the first column here are the estimates for the three significant hits from that paper. And we replicated it. And um, so if you look at this first SNP, it's estimated 0.1. That's the effect size. But in the replication, it was 0 0.07, 0 0.077. Um, so it dropped by about 30%. The second one, it looks like it just went up slightly. The third one went down slightly. But on average, we are seeing that in the replication sample, the effects are depressed a little, a little bit. So we could correct them, though, and say, well, what do we think that the effect is um, doing a, a Bayesian correction? And, uh, and this Bayesian correction actually looks like it was a little bit too conservative. We're, we're correcting too much in this case. And I don't know how much of that is just because um, uh, you know, these individual SNP estimates we should think of as biased. Part of it may also be because in this case, I did a, a normally I, d I did the Gaussian case correction in this paper, um, and, and that in general will, will shrink too much if it's actually spike and slab. Um, we can talk more about that later if you're interested, uh, but I think we should keep moving. Um, so yeah, so that's the individual level, but let's say we want to do something aggregate. So we've been talking about doing power calculations. So let's say you um, wanted to know how well powered we are to replicate, our, replicate a group of significant findings. So in the, in the educational attainment paper, we found 74 significant hits, and then we tried to replicate them in the UK Biobank. Um, now, if we want to do a power analysis to know how likely it is that we'll be able to replicate, we need to have the true effect sizes, the true betas, instead of our winner's curse inflated beta hats. Um, and so we can then correct them using this Bayesian method that I talked about just very briefly um, and get winner's curse corrected estimates, which across all 74 SNPs, hopefully they're, they're more right on average. Um, and so in educational attainment, like I told you, we used Gaussian effect sizes. Um, and the fraction of SNPs we expected to have a p-value below, um, below 0 0.05, we expected about 40 to be below that, 40 out of 74. And we ended up getting 52 out of 74. So we did better than expected by, the, by this calculation. Again, I think that's because we did the Gaussian, the Gaussian correction, which is going to be overly conservative. Um, in uh, the subjective well-being paper that we did recently, we tried to replicate that as well. But here we assumed the spike and slab. So we're allowing some SNPs to be null. 
Um, and there, of the 19 effects that we found across the three phenotypes we looked at, we expected 16.7 of them to, to replicate at a p-value of 05, and 16 out of 19 did. And so that seemed to work a lot better. Um, so the summary here, when, when, um, so here's, here's the big thing. If you want to use the same sample for SNP selection, for gene identification and estimation, you're going to get biased estimates. And so, so you should keep in mind that just in general, not only when you're doing GWAS work, but all empirical work, if you're, if you're trying to identify some model or you're trying to identify which factors are important for something or another, the ones that you identify in your analysis are going to have, the effects are going to be too big. You should, you should uh, realize that. Um, there are some approaches that allow us to correct for, for, for bias, um, but those aren't going to be good, you know, at a, at a SNP by SNP or a factor by factor level, but they will be right on average. Great, so that's, that's the winner's curse. Do people have questions about that? Yeah. Okay. And I would think that with the effect of winner's curse kind of, well, with the actual adjustment, would you observe it to be smaller over time? So when you say small effect size, do you mean, so, so, so because you could multiply your phenotype by like 0 0.001 and then it's a small effect size, but you're talking like well, unpowered, like if you're not well powered. Yeah, and that's right. And that goes back to the, the equation that we plopped up here. If, if you're not incredibly well powered, then the probability that it's significant given beta um, is, is going to be very small. And so this bias term is going to be very large. Mm -hmm. And again, so that's why in, in genetic data, it, it can be especially bad because uh, we're looking for these small effects relative to the sample sizes. We have to estimate them. We happy? Yeah, Dan. That's true. Okay, yeah. Good point, Dan. Dan keeps telling me that I should say it's true in all research and we should be good consumers of bad re or like, you know, <laughs> <we should. laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so we should, we should keep that in mind always. Um, if, we're, if we're underpowered, then this inflation is likely to be large, um, no matter what we're studying. Should we talk about stratification? What time am I supposed to go until? Do I have 40 minutes? 40 more minutes. Okay, we can talk about it. So we might not get through all the slides I have for stratification, and if I don't, then what we'll do is we'll just um, finish them tomorrow. Uh, so let me... Uh, whoops, that's the... Great. Um, okay, so we've used this example like 90 times already. So I was trying to think, after, after Dan used it, like three times today and once yesterday, I'm like, maybe I could change this to like the, the Borscht gene or, or the Haggis gene or something. Um, but like, let's, let's say that we did a GWAS of, of chopstick use um, and we find a bunch of really strong hits, right? As, as Dan said, you know, do we, do we like them? Do we think these are real genetic effects? Who thinks we found real genetic effects? Who doesn't? I don't think so. Okay, great, we're learning. Um, okay, so, so this, this problem is, is called stratification. And so I'm going to talk about exactly where it comes from. In the problem set, you're going to go through this um, more carefully in a special case. Um, but this is, this is a, a, a big problem in general. Um, and so here's our model. And so uh, we have some phenotype Y. And, and it's a... Um, so a linear, we have a, we're in a linear space, so it's a linear combination of a bunch of genotypes, X, um, and the effects are these betas. But we also have some, some group-specific um, fixed effect. And, um, and this group-specific specific fixed effect may be correlated with, with the genotypes. So the genotypes may be predictive of what group a person comes from. Um, this, will, this is going to arise, for example, if we have two groups that have been separated for a long time and so allele frequencies start drifting. 
um, then that's one thing you could do it. There could also just be differential selection. There's lots of reasons why different groups might have different allele frequencies. And if these frequencies change, then all of a sudden your SNPs are going to be predictive of a person's group. And so that's, that's the world we live in, and that's where you're going to get into trouble. Um, and then epsilon here is, is just whatever is residual, environmental effects or, or um, nonlinear effects that aren't captured by the linear model. Um, and so throughout here, I'm going to just assume that the phenotype and the genotypes are standardized, so they have mean zero and variance one, just to simplify the algebra. Um, and I'm also allowing the, these SNPs to be correlated, so we're not going to pretend that they're independent. And so they could be correlated um, due to LD. We've talked a lot about LD. And so if they're correlated due to LD, that means that they're likely close together, so that's helpful. But they also end up, they may be correlated because of stratification. <laughs> And, and that type of correlation could span across the genome. Uh, we already talked about how G and X may be uncorrelated, but the environment's going to be independent of both G and X, or the residual is. Oh, so this is just what we were talking about. Okay, so, so the genotypes are going to be related for one of two reasons, linkage disequilibrium, so that we inherit these genes together, um, also due to population structure. Um, I just explained this whole thing. So. Um, when, when, uh, when we have had this drift and we have groups that have different allele frequencies, we'll say that the, the, the population or the SNP is, is stratified by, by the group. Um, great. What's, what is a convenient result that I'm also not going to derive, but if you're really excited about it, I can walk through it with you in office hours, is that this covariance, the covariance due to LD and the covariance due to population stratification is additive. And so this will, this will help us in, in the further derivations. And so the, co the covariance of a pair of SNPs is equal to the covariance due to LD plus the covariance due to stratification. And so when we're doing a GWAS, the, um, when we're estimating a GWAS for a particular SNP, that's equal to the covariance of the phenotype and the genotype divided by the variance of the genotype. So that's just a, a, an OLS result. And so we, we want to derive how, where the stratification bias is coming from. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, oh, where did my variance go? That's OK, sorry. So all of, all of these terms here should be divided by the variance of x. Um, but uh, so I'm going to substitute in um, what y is from our model from the previous slide. And so y is equal to the sum over x betas plus g plus epsilon. And then covariance is a, is a linear operator, and so we can separate all these out um, through, the, through the sum. And so what we end up with is it's the sum of the squared correlation due to LD times beta plus the sum of the squared correlation due to uh, population stratification plus the covariance between X and G, which is also arising because of population stratification. And so this, this first term here is, is fine because it represents you know, true genetic effects. But it's this, these last two terms, covariance between SNPs because of stratification and covariance of these population fix effects because of stratification um, that are going to lead to bias in our GWAS estimates. So why, why do we care more about the bias due to stratification than, you know, the bias in this term, because if what we want are the betas, but we're getting sort of the sum over the uh, over SNPs and LD. Mm -hmm. Because in the first term we're still proxying for causal effects. Yeah, yeah. So, so because we have this nice thing that SNPs and LD tend to be close to each other, then any signal that's picked up by by bias due to just linkage disequilibrium still will represent signal local to the SNP that we're looking at. And so, so you know, at least we can, we can feel comfortable about, you know, we find a significant SNP, um, and the, the interpretation is we don't know that that SNP is the important SNP, but we know it's near the important SNP. Whereas if we see a significant effect and there's stratification, we have no idea where that signal's coming from. Um, and we also know that that signal is actually just representing that a person's from a different group, and, and we're not interested in that. So, um, so when, when a population is stratified, there's, there, there's two types of, of covariance that, that arise. So first off, let's say that um, in one population, there's a SNP that has a really high allele frequency relative to another population. 
this is going to be a bad explanation. I'm realizing as I'm saying this aloud. Um, so, so let's say that there's some SNP and it's highly predictive of the group that you're in because of the way that the allele frequencies have shifted. And then you have another SNP on another, uh, on another chromosome that is also highly predictive of the group you're in because of genetic drift or, or something like that. Um, because both of those SNPs are, are correlated with what group you're in, they're going to be correlated with each other. And so that's, that's that problem. And so, so what this means here is that some of the bias is because that SNP is picking up signal. It's, it is a genetic signal, but it's a, it's a genetic signal that is somewhere in the genome that we don't know about. And so it's not very informative. This term here is if, um, so G is the fixed effect for the group that you're in. And so if the SNP is predictive of what group that you're in, um, then the SNP is going to be correlated with this fixed effect. And so the, the effect of the, the GWAS estimate is not only going to be telling you the, um, you know, the actual genetic effects, but it's just going to be picking up some signal due to the fact that maybe someone in, you know, a person in one group is more likely to be smokers or, or um, it's more likely to have schizophrenia for non-genetic reasons. So that last term is the chopstick. The last, yeah, yeah, that's true. So this term is the chopstick term. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that often we, we think about this. This term actually, if, if we were able to estimate um, jointly all SNPs, then this term wouldn't be a problem because, you know, we wouldn't, we'd be estimating the betas directly and we'd have a bunch of betas when we were done. Yeah, so this, this, this term is the chopstick gene problem. This, this term is just a result of, you know, because we're doing GWAS and only looking at one SNP at a time. But we want to be able to interpret the GWAS coefficient as a local effect. Um, okay, so, so let's say we, we, we don't know, you know, we, we don't know if our um, sample is, is stratified or not, and so we want to try to, to measure whether or not there's stratification in our sample. And so there's two main ways that we can do this, um, within family methods or we can use LD score regression. Um, so let's say that we have um, a pair of siblings. And, and rather than just doing a straight GWAS when we're looking at individuals, we first take differences in the phenotype and regress that on differences, oh, okay, regress that on, on differences in, in the genotype. Um, what's nice about this is that people within the same family are from the same group. And so when we take this difference, this group effect, which was causing this chopstick gene problem, is, is going to be differenced out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear uh, from the model. And so when we regress here, it's going to get rid of all of those nasty terms um, that, that were causing us a headache before. And so you're going you're gonna to show this more carefully in the problem set. Um, but yeah, and so, so, uh, yeah, so all we're left with, when we're estimating the, the beta within family, doing the sibling differences, all we have is this single term where it's the beta, but still, you know, but, uh, but it's just the beta due to sort of local LD. We don't have to worry about these additional um, stratification across chromosomes or just because it's related to the fixed effect. So that's nice. The problem is that usually family data is very small, right? You know, you're lucky if you have like, you're really lucky if you have like 20,000 or something like that, and that's just not enough for gene discovery. And so, um, so that doesn't seem incredibly useful. Um, but what's done in, oh, Dan? So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask you or everyone else about intuition or what you think about this. Um, so I'm gonna ask you how, why we think family is a good Who, does, is, does anyone want to take a stab at Dan's question? So why is it that if we use family data, why, why, why would we expect the bias from stratification to disappear? I feel like this side of the room has been very quiet. I think someone from that side of the room should take, to, should take a guess. Or if you don't want to, that's fine too. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, they're from, the, they're from the same group. And so if there's variation within the group, 
So the, the problem, the problem of, uh, you know, the reason we have stratification is because some of the variation in the SNP is predicting the group that you're from. If there's variation within the family, is that going to predict what group you're from? Uh, no. Is that sufficiently intuitive for you, Dan? You're happy? Uh, James? Um, my own opinion is that that justification is not satisfactory. You don't like it. We, we, have, we have seen that um, merely conditioning uh, is not guaranteed to eliminate biases because of, like, for example, you, uh, if you condition on everyone having a high SAT score, uh, you actually create an association that might not even have existed before, a reverse design or whatever. Uh, the justification I would give would, would not be some kind of conditioning or stratifying it would be based on the fact that deviations of siblings from the expected genotypes uh, inferred from the genotypes of the parents are totally random. Uh, that is, uh, they're not correlated with anything. And so this goes back to Fisher's argument that if treatment levels are randomly assigned, uh, that any differences between the treatment levels must be due to the causal effect of whatever is different about the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess that's, that's kind of even a, a stronger um, you know, the, the, the randomness within a family is, is even a stronger explanation because um, the variation is independent of everything. Yeah, that, that's Mendel's first law, and that's mm -hmm. observed ever since the beginning of the 20th century when we first looked at grasshopper cells where the chromosomes are larger than 15 under the microscope. Uh, whether one chromosome, the paternal or the maternal, goes into the gamete uh, can't even be predicted by, like, what other ones go. I mean... Mm -hmm. I find that pretty satisfactory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, something I mentioned earlier, but under two conditions, one measurement error, um, uh, mean regressive me measurement error, um, and two niche formation within the family. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there, there are there are some assumptions that you need additionally. Yeah, and and they and. They'll, they'll dig into what those assumptions are. So we're, we're relying pretty heavily on some independence between um, siblings um, here uh, in order for these within family tests to be fine. Um, Sorry, this, this, this is a conversation we had the Make sure that your statistical test only depends on the assumption that Mendel's first law is valid. Uh, so if you perform such a permutation test, um, then the, the beta, that's just a way of weighting uh, the permutation test so that it has you know, the optimal power under the circumstances. Uh, and there, and once you, if you can reject the null hypothesis, uh, then uh, that's it. I mean, it might be that the beta is not externally valid. Uh, but you can be sure that that SNP is either a causal SNP or is linked to the causal variance. Mm -hmm. so you, can, you can be sure. There's one more assumption that I think I haven't been explicit about. It. And that is that James, so use the language of you know, the, the lecture. It may be true that in the population as a whole, the, the um, gene content of two siblings are born So that's, 
God has blessed you through mining, and as you work in nutrition samples, what was the process by which I found that these fruits from the population? Is there any reason to think that some of them are slightly different? So we don't know. Put that in concrete, and you mean like if you, uh, the sub subset of siblings in which you're identifying the causal effect of the SNF also have to be discordant on that SNF. So you're, that too. you're, you're, you're identifying on, on a certain subpopulation where the allele frequencies generate discordancy within the family, but if then you have large portions of the population that are homozygous. <coughs> so, so, so even, even if in the population there's actually two, that means the, um, that the all siblings carry the whole genes, and the fact that not going to contribute identifying variation or giving the family a fixed effect. So suppose that we knew in the population exactly who those are, even if we draw randomly from the ones that are discordant, we do that and then we lose some, then there's a, there's a non-random loss of some of these um, observations, then, then we, 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 we still can't be completely confident that the estimate is going to be causal. Sure, but what, why are we having non-random losses? <laughs> no, it's not because in practice the way people select into service might be like, well, we think everyone's there, it's the education, all of that. Ben. I mean, it would, it, would, it would inflate it towards zero and away from zero, though, right? It would be, you'd still, the, the estimate would, would still be, um, you know, on, on, the, on the same side of the... Um, so ma imagine something like um, skin color. So imagine that you have variants in skin color within a family and parents behave a certain way, um, consciously or unconsciously, and promote the, um, give more, more resources to the lighter skin kids. And then, let's say in society as a whole, for education, we have a policy of affirmative action so that, and this is, I'm, I'm conflating race, I mean, this is not like European only population, so that actually in the group level, being, having this allele for darker skin means that you're gonna get an educational advantage. And, th and this is like, I'm ignoring a lot of things as part of it, but you could just imagine some scenario where the what parents do or what siblings themselves do within a family is different than what is happening at the population level, um, and you would, in fact, get different signs. Or, and again, hmm. it's, that's a chopstick thing, but it's 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 cultural. We know that all we don't know so, socially evoked. Uh, resp environmental responses, RGE, is part of the effect. Hmm. Okay, okay, yeah. So all this discussion, um, so I mean, I think, I think the highlight here is that, you know, at, at one point we assumed that the 
residual for one sibling is independent of the genotype and residual of the other sibling. And so all these things that we're talking about with like parents choosing to try to make their kids more similar or more different um, are, are violations of, of that kind of assumption. Dan? So they tend to be very similar. <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, that's true. Um, so, so yeah, so it's true that lots of problems could arise. Practically, it seems like they tend to be very similar. So, so um, and that's what we were trying to do. The whole point of doing these within family um, estimates, because we can't use them for gene identification, we can use them to see if our GWAS estimates um, seem to have a lot of stratification in them. So like, let's, let's say that we did a GWAS of a chopstick use, um, and we think that pretty much all of the signal that we find is, is due to stratification in that case. Then when we do our within-family estimates, the only signal, I mean, there's, there's, we, we shouldn't, um, you know, all, all of our estimates should be centered at zero, right? We're just going to get a bunch of, of uh, Gaussian estimates that have mean zero. And so what's the probability then that the sign of this mean zero normally distributed within family estimate is going to be the same sign as this really strong um, you know, GWAS, individual level GWAS estimate? Um, well, the, the sign of the within family estimate is just random, right? So half of the probability is negative and half the probability is positive and so, um, and so in general, if there's no signal at all, then half of the signs, we'd expect half of the signs of the GWAS estimates and the within family estimates to, to correspond. And so if we see more than half um, concordance in sign of our GWAS estimates and our within family estimates, then that must mean that there's some genetic signal there that's being picked up because um, the sign concordance would just be if, if there's genetic signal pushing the mean away from zero in the within family case in the same direction as, as, the, as the GWAS. And so we can, do, we can first do a sign test and, and, um, uh, and, you know, and test to see is how, how likely is it that we would have seen this degree of sign concordance if the, um, if the expected sign concordance at every SNP is zero and if we can reject that then we can say okay there's some genetic signal this is great. But we might want to say something more than that. We might want to say well okay Maybe there's some genetic signal, um, but how, you know, maybe there's still some stratification. And I want to know how much stratification there is in our estimate relative to the genetic signal. And so what you could maybe do here is we could compare the, the magnitude of the GWAS estimates to the within family estimates. And so we could do that just by regressing one on the other. Um, and with a little math, um, which we don't have time to, to talk. I was going to maybe do it on the board, but I don't think I will. Um, with a little math, what you do uh, when, when you estimate, when you regress the within family estimates onto the GWAS estimates, um, you're estimating this expression here. So in the numerator, it's the variance of beta. So this is how much, the beta represents true genetic signal. And so in the numerator, we have how much of the variance is due to true genetic signal divided by the variance of true genetic signal plus the variance due to stratification plus the variance due to estimation error. And so, um, but you know, that estimation error is a little irritating because we don't care how much genetic signal there is relative to the sampling variance. Um, fortunately, we know how much estimation error there is because that's what we estimate when we're estimating a standard error. A standard error is how much of the variance in the estimate is, is due to just estimation error. And so we can subtract that term out using the standard errors from the GWAS. And then once we have that, all we have is the fraction of variance due to genetic signal divided by the fraction due to genetic signal plus the fraction due to stratification. And so that's going to be the, the fraction of variance. Um, I guess this is the amount of variance. And so this is now the fraction of the variance in the beta estimates due to genetic signal versus stratification. And so if this is, if there is no stratification, then there's no variance due to stratification. So this term in the denominator is zero and this thing is one. But if it's all stratification and there's no variance due to genetic signal, then the variance of beta is equal to zero. And so we're going to be getting something close to zero. And so this, this gives us, you know, a nice 
um, interpretable um, estimate of how much variation there is. So I, I think that uh, um, you know we apply this in the uh, okay. I have five minutes or ten. I have ten minutes, right? Um, one of the other things that you have to have is that your GWAS estimate is um, independent of your within family estimates, right? Because otherwise, some, there's some, going to be some covariance between your within family and your GWAS estimate. And so, um, so you'd need to have summary statistics that um, come from independent samples, and that may or may not be available. So this is kind of, it's, it's kind of slick, it's nice, it's simple, um, but, but it requires having a particular sort of data. Yeah. Yeah, in general, or I mean, like it's it's sometimes close to, uh, you know, 0.9 on the upper side of 0.9. So there, there's often a little bit. I mean, it's with you know relatively wide standard errors. Almost always you um, uh, the standard error includes one, but it sometimes goes down as low as like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and so we can we can at least you know reject with 95% confidence that. You know, at least 80%, we can reject that more than 20% of the signals due to stratification with something like this. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm assuming that data from the GWAS is after controlling for principal components? Uh, yeah, usually. Right, so you still drop down to like 0.7 sometime after making those. Yeah, so, yeah, so if we didn't do anything like controlling for principal components like we've talked about, then, then we'd do quite poorly. We'd see that maybe there's a lot of stratification. But, um, but yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Like the, the how much above the, the line you are at the median, you know the the old the old school reduction that people use for they use. I mean, it depends on how polygenic the trait is, right? I and mean, we'll talk about that um, a little later. Um, I mean, well, it might be tomorrow at this point. It's uh, it's enough later in the slides. Um, but if it's if it's a highly polygenic trait, then then most of the genomic inflation is going to be due to polygenicity and not not stratification. Also, it depends on how well you controlled for stratification as well. Okay. How would you conjecture seven percent larva will change with bigger and bigger samples? With bigger and bigger samples. So, I. This is this, so so so. This is like a population estimator, is going to be. Um, I think it's unbiased, and so so it should. As you increase sample size, the fraction of the variance due to stratification should should be. So the problem that you run into, here's here's the, here's the actual problem that I think that David's trying to get at. Um, so let's let's say that the you know we 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 estimate that maybe 10% of the variation in the betas is due to stratification. Um, you know under under you know under the assumption that this variance due to stratification is sort of spread evenly throughout the genome. If we have like a really big hit like FTO for BMI where it's just relatively it has has a pretty large effect. Um, then a little bit of variance due to stratification for that hit is, is maybe not very large relative to the size of the effect of FTO. But when we estimate, when we have a really large sample size, we're estimating you know, these really, really small effects. And so the actual betas are very small, but they might be a little biased due to the stratification. And so, so this variance of S could be large relative to the magnitude of the, the, the beta that corresponds to that SNP. Um, and so, so I, I think that's kind of what, what David's saying. So although 
you know, this, this number of what fraction of the variation due to stratification you know, is, is going to be constant as you increase sample size, we should be more skeptical, you know, for, for a fixed level of amount of bias due to stratification, um, we should be more skeptical of SNPs that have small estimated effect sizes because more of that may be due to stratification. Yeah, you'd have to deal with selection by effect size, but you could maybe find some way around it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you if you if you selected by p-value threshold and then, but also did something to address the fact that you're selecting on beta first, which is which is problematic. But yeah, you would ex you would expect this to, you know, the amount the amount of variance due to stratification I would expect to be much larger for small effects than for large effects. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your within family can't be a subset of your G1 investment. That's Does right. That hold for the sign test? Yes, because um, because the error. So so w w with a sign test, what we rely on is that the within family, the 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 error term, the variance due to estimation error, it needs to be independent of of what's estimated in the GWAS, and so. Um, yeah, so you, you might get increased sign concordance because if you get a large estimate um, in a sample including the within family, then you're maybe maybe that's driven by your within family sample. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, yeah. I'm I'm wondering if the the amount of strat bias from stratification you're getting at ten percent or twenty percent figure from this exercise is informative in some way. Is it is it a measure of environmental influence by ancestral group, is it, I mean, that you would expect a effect size distribution aside for a moment. You know, we, we have priors about certain phenotypes that would be, like chopstick use, that would be subject to stratification, cultural influences, etc., versus phenotypes that should not be. And is that the pattern that you see when you do height, the bias from stratification? Yeah, so, so the, prob the problem is that, again, you can't do this regression test un unless you have, I mean, you have to have the data. You, and so, right, and so I, we haven't done this in a, for a lot of phenotypes because it requires having the cohort level data. Um, or or just, I guess it just, you need, if you had a within family sample that wasn't include, included in the publicly released. Um, so I, I don't know how well this works across a lot of phenotypes. But for the phenotypes that we've done it for, so education and subjective well-being, um, it's uh, you know that's that's kind of what we're getting. Great. Um, so I was going to talk about LD score regression, but that's going to take more than three minutes. Um, let me let me just give you a, a a super brief overview of what it's what it tries to accomplish. And then we'll go through the derivation of it carefully. So this LD score regression is, is I think, one of the most exciting methodological things that's happening right now. And, um, but it does rely on a few funny assumptions um, that we should talk about and understand. And so that's why I wanted to go through the derivation with you all um, so that you can understand um, that this really powerful tool that's available to us, why um, uh, you know, what its limitations may be and how we should interpret the results it spits out. Um, and so, so just as an overview to get you excited about what it, um, the idea behind it. So as, as we've been saying over and over again, when we have a GWAS estimate, it's not only capturing the signal for the specific SNP, but it's also capturing the signal of everything that it's in LD with, right? And so if you have a SNP that is correlated with a ton of other SNPs, it, in principle, may pick up a lot more signal from those SNPs relative to one that's not correlated with anything else, right? 
And so what LD score regression, the, the, base, the, the premise of it is that, well, we can look then at you know, how many SNPs, uh, how many other SNPs a particular SNP is correlated with, and that should be proportional to you know, how, um, you know, how significant um, that particular SNP is. And that relationship between how, uh, and how, much, how correlated that SNP is with others and how much stronger the signal is at that SNP allows you to do things like estimate um, heritability. It allows you to estimate... Um, oh, and the other, the other main point too is that anything that isn't correlated with, um, with how much LD is, is likely just due to other sources of, of inflation of the chi-square statistic like stratification. And we think that stratification is the main, the main culprit there. And so, um, so we're going to regress a line, and on the x-axis, we're going to, here, I'll do it this way for you guys. On the x-axis, it's going to be what, how much, how, and how strong LD is that SNP with a bunch of other SNPs. And in this direction, it's going to be what's the chi-squared statistic of that SNP. And so the intercept in that case corresponds to a SNP that's not an LD with anything, including itself, I guess. Um, but, so, so that will be sampling variance and stratification. And so looking at the intercept, we can make inference about how much stratification there is in our sample. And so that's, that's the basic idea behind it. We'll work through it carefully and talk about what assumptions you need for that to work. Um, as a final note before we go, I was going to say this at the beginning, and, and I didn't. But um, we're, we, I, I think we spend so much time about stratification because it's really important. You know how like um, when you're in a seminar and people ask the same questions all the time, it's like, uh, did you cluster your standard errors? Or if someone presents like an instrumental variable, they're like, well, what about the exclusion restriction? You know, that, that should be the first thing you think of any time someone um, presents like an instrumental variables problem or, you know. If someone's presenting any work involving genetics, the very first thing that you should think, if you want to think critically about their work, is how is stratification going to affect these results? And so if you come away from this workshop and you've learned nothing at all except for one thing, what, what I want you to learn is if anyone shows you anything about genetics, your first thought should be, is there stratification? Are these results driven by stratification? And so, um, and so this, is why, this is why this is really important, and, um, and this is why I hope that we can drill this into a little bit. It's also, you should also think about multiple testing, if you want. Power. Or power. <laughs> but what you should really think about is stratification. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's it for today. I think we have a little break and then we'll go into office hours, right?